Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our 10th annual Women's Forum. The Women's Forum was started by the Human Relations Department to celebrate and honor the achievements of local Durham women during Women's History Month. The 2012 theme for National Women's History Month is Women's Education is Women's Empowerment. This year's National Women's History Month resolution stated that women have been leaders not only in securing their own rights of suffrage and equal opportunity, but also in the abolitionist movement, the emancipation movement, the industrial labor movement, the civil rights movement, and others. However, despite all of these contributions, the role of American women in history has been consistently overlooked and undervalued. This is one of the main reasons that we chose this month to celebrate the contributions of local women and to allow you the opportunity to hear successful women tell their story in their own words so that you can be inspired and motivated. For many of you in the audience, I know that you have your own personal stories of women who have encouraged you and helped you in your life and careers. We encourage you to let us know who they are and we would love to add them to the list for next year's forum. Uh, before I ask the chair of the commission to come up, uh, I would like to recognize, uh, I see one of our directors here, and that's uh, the interim director of community development, Reginald, if you please stand. Okay, there, are there other directors that I overlooked that are here? Okay. Um, now I would like to ask for Larry Thomas to please stand. Larry Thomas is the founder of the Thomas Mentor Leadership Academy. And this academy is a new mentoring organization in Durham. Uh, Larry called and he said that he saw the flyer advertised in the forum and he wanted to know if he could bring some of his young men ages 10 to 15 to assist with the program. He said that they were trying to teach the young men about giving back through helping others. And so the young men that you saw when you came in and uh, that were those that, that escorted the panelists up front, uh, they are in his group. And let's give them a hand. They look really good. And uh, I would also like to recognize the human relations staff, but it looks like some of them are still out on the front, so we'll do that at the end. We'll talk with them. Um, now, I would like for the chair of the Durham Human Relations Commission, Joy Morgan, to come forward and provide greetings on behalf of the commission. First of all, let me say good evening. I'm very, very, um, I'm going to say ecstatic to see so many people to come out to support the women of Durham who actually are making a difference in Durham. It's not often that we get to fill up the room, so I'm glad to see you all here. So in my greetings, I am saying thank you for coming, um, that I am glad to see you, and I am glad to see that you are here to support such esteemed women. I hope that on the behalf of the Human Relations Commission that you enjoy the program, that your questions are answered, that your issues may be even be resolved in, your answering, in the answering of your questions, and I hope you have a wonderful night. Thank you. And next, I would like to call up uh, Honorable Cora Cole McFadden, our Councilwoman, thank you. Good afternoon. Come on, good afternoon. I know you're exhausted, and so am I. But we have, we have to keep this Durham spirit, especially with all these great women uh, in this place. Uh, honorees, guests, staff, and all assembled in this place for this awesome celebration. It is indeed an honor and a great joy to bring you greetings on behalf of the greatest mayor on earth. 
Uh, you give him a round of applause. Uh, the Honorable William V. Bill Bell and the members of the Durham uh, City Council as we recognize how blessed, thank you Vivian, she's the top woman too, I tell you, she gets the job done, as we recognize how blessed this city is because of the marvelous work of these awesome, phenomenal women whose contributions we celebrate today. Please know that your work has not gone unnoticed. This month, we celebrate women for being innovators, the rock and foundation of families, neighborhoods, organizations. But we know that throughout the year, women continue to make history through the lives we touch, the difference we make wherever we are. The trials, the obstacles, the tests are many. The misunderstanding of our unshakable resolve, even when we continue to be the best at whatever we decide to do, we manage to do that because of our strength. So we applaud the women we celebrate in particular today, but all women who dare to make a difference not seeking publicity, fame, or fortune, but just doing what we do. So as we advance in our careers, let us continue to celebrate who we are by paving the way for others, for someone stooped down so that we could ride on their shoulders into a better world. Lastly, we must continue to embrace our youth. We have no choice. They need us. God bless each of you, and congratulations on your honor, and thank you for all that you do to make Durham the great place that it is. Thank you so much for those words of welcome. We hope that the stories that you hear today will motivate and inspire you and help you to understand that you too can be successful despite obstacles in your path. At this time, let me introduce our esteemed panel to my left. Um, Dr. Tara L. Fites, Deirdre Hodge, Wanda Page, Yesenia L. Polanco, Goldames, Cynthia Penn, and Nancy Weichel. In the interest of time, we will have a question answer session after we hear from all of the panelists. And you will be provided little uh, cards. So if you have a question, you hear something that you want to pursue further with the panelists, please jot it down. And we will take up those cards as, um, as you, you know, just raise your hand. We have uh, the young men that are helping us with that process. And uh, also, I will give a brief introduction of each panelist. And following the introduction, each will have eight to 10 minutes to provide their presentation. Uh, you don't have to save your applause to the end, however. We want you to welcome them with your applause. And also, when they conclude their presentation, uh, we'll have, we always have time for applause. That's fine. Uh, so let's get started with our presentations. Our first panelist is Dr. Tara L. Fikes. Dr. Tara L. Fikes has over 28 years of experience in the administration of various federal, state, and local housing programs. She currently serves as the Housing, Human Rights, and Community Development Director for Orange County, North Carolina, a position she has held for 26 years. She is a native of Washington, D.C., but grew up in Durham, which she calls home. Tara has a BA degree in Public Administration from North Carolina Central University and uh, a MPA from North Carolina State University and a doctorate of public administration degree from the University of Southern California. Dr. Fikes also served as an, as serves as an adjunct assistant professor at North Carolina Central University in the public administration department. She also currently serves as the president of the Durham chapter, 
the Durham graduate chapter, that is, of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, Incorporated. Uh, Dr. Fikes is a lifelong member of St. Mark AME Zion Church in Durham, North Carolina, where she is a member of the trustee board, the choir, and the AIDS care team ministry. In her spare time, she enjoys reading, shopping, and cross-stitching. Uh, without further ado, please welcome Dr. Tara L. Fikes. flooded with the people, the many, many people who have helped me along my way. There are so many that I couldn't even begin to name them all, but I thought it was important that I share that with you this evening. So my story will be the story of how others have helped me along the way. In Greek mythology, the original mentor is a character in Homer's epic poem, The Odyssey. When Odysseus, the king of Ithaca, left for the Trojan War, he entrusted the care of his kingdom and his son to mentor his good friend. While he was away, the relationship between mentor and his friend grew to such an extent that the term mentor became known. And we in the English language adopted that term because it means that a person who is a mentor has a special relationship. That person gives knowledge, gives wisdom. Webster says that, that person is a trusted counselor, a trusted guide. Usually that individual is older usually has more experience than the protege, and, and devotes a significant amount of time to helping to guide one's development out of a, a sense of genuineness, out of love, out of concern, rather than out of personal gain. So I say before to you tonight that mentors, many mentors have helped me along the way. As Delilah said in the introduction, I did grow up here in Durham, and uh, my parents, unfortunately, passed away um, early in life, early in my life and early in their life as well. But they both were from Durham, and I was here in Durham, and so all of their friends, all of the community helped me. So it is true that when you lose a parent, or both parents in this case, there's always somebody there to stand in the gap. So I had many people to do that. Um, my parents' friends did that. My family did that. And all oh, my church did that. St. Mark AME Zion Church. They certainly were a real church family. And then I went to the public schools here in Durham, and I happened upon um, many people who knew my parents and many who grew up with them and many who just thought it was important that we nurture, nurture our children. And I don't know how much of that happens now, but back when I was in school, and it wasn't that long ago, but back when I was in school, that was really important. And so our school teachers and our principals really nurtured me uh, along the way. And then I went to college, went to North Carolina Central University and majored in public administration. And now, I need to tell you the brief story before I got there. As, as most um, kids have big dreams, I had a big dream of being a pediatrician. And then I took a chemistry class. <laughs> I took a zoology class. And I realized I had to change my major. So I was interested in the um, health field, and so I wanted to, I thought maybe administration. Health administration might be the idea. But then when I looked upon the offerings at North Carolina Central University, there were, they didn't have health administration. Instead, they had business administration and they had public administration. So I knew I didn't want to be a part of the corporate world, so I chose public administration. 
And boy, did I meet even more people who would mentor me and guide me and show me the way, one of whom is still a mentor to this day. But most importantly, while at North Carolina Central University, I took a public personnel administration class, and the instructor just happened to be the personnel director for Orange County, North Carolina. And at the time, I don't know how that, that was really significant for me because I can remember having a long discussion with her about why she gave me a 99 on a test. A really long discussion about why I had a 99 on a test where you could get 100. Little did I know that this same person I would meet some six months later when I became employed at Orange County. And believe me, she remembered <laughs> that I challenged her on that 99 grade. But the lesson there is you never know who you might meet and where you might meet them later. So you need to be careful <laughs> what you say. You need to be careful what you say. But we all, we laughed about it at, at that time. And I was so glad to get a job after college. I was the nicest person. I didn't argue. I, I, I begged her pardon. I apologized profusely because I was glad to have a job with some benefits. Um, while employed at Orange County, I met several people who, I, who later would lead me along the way and have led me over the 28 years that I have been there. And one particular experience sticks out for me. Um, there was a gentleman, the oldest gentleman actually, in the department. When I started working, um, I was a community development specialist and that required me to go out into the field and inspect um, houses. The county vehicles were a straight shift, you know, a manual transmission. I had no clue about a manual transmission. So this older gentleman took me out on the hills of Hillsboro to show me how to drive a straight shift vehicle. And I have always remembered that because he didn't have to do that. Nobody in my family had a straight shift, so had he not done that, I don't know what in the world I would have done. Um, this same gentleman actually um, helped me when I got promoted to the position that I'm in now. Actually took me aside and said to me, because I was in a position where I was becoming the director of a department where I had, had um, been a part of the department. So my peers were becoming my subordinates. And this gentleman um, actually took me aside and said, um, I'm here. I will help you. I will show you the way. And I know this is a women's history forum, but I must acknowledge that because that was major for me. That was major. And he did just that. He helped me the entire time he was there to his retirement. In fact, I tried to hold on to him when he retired. And he said, no, I can't keep working because I want to get my Social Security. And if I keep working, that's going to mess up my Social Security because I've already been to the administra Social Security Administration to find out how much I can make. So I can't keep working. You, you'll be all right. You'll be all right. Um, and as, so, as I said, I've had many mentors while in Orange County. I've had a particular, particularly the social services director, the former social services director, um, Marty Pryor Cook, um, was a mentor to me. Um, that was the person I went to when I needed some wisdom. That was the person I went to when I needed to hire somebody. That was the person I went to when I had performance issues, either with... Um, um, usually with my subordinates, not me, with my subordinates. Um, that's the person that I went to. And as fate would have it, um, we have been moving, the department has been moving around, and today my office is her former office. So she is certainly still watching over. Uh, about the same year that I became the Director of Housing and Community Development, I also had another um, really spectacular event occur, and that is that I became a member of the first sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And in becoming a member, I gained many, many mentors, many, many friends, many, many young ladies who helped me along the way, who helped me even today. And it, oh, it's only appropriate that I would 
join Alpha Kappa Alpha because it is a sorority dedicated to providing service to all mankind. And that was right down my line because I certainly believe in service to all. I have been involved in many service projects in the community. Um, I started, and my very first service project was um, starting to work with um, the Alliance of AIDS Services around the um, disease HIV and AIDS because I had a good friend who passed away from that disease. And so I became real concerned about people being educated and people being informed about that disease. And I think that just started the ball rolling. And since then, I have been involved in very, various other um, community service projects as well. And even on a day, I actually gave blood one time. And since I gave blood that one time, I have become a regular uh, Red Cross donor. So, you know, sometimes all you need is a little spark from somebody, and great things can happen. So, in closing, I say to you today that mentorship is important. I'm sure that most of you, if you think about it, and if you look around, you have many people who have helped you along the way. Many people that you could point to as mentors. I urge you to treasure those relationships, to thank those mentors every opportunity that you get. Because of them, you are who you are today, and I am who I am today. So I leave you with just remember that if you have good mentors, the valley experiences that you have in life won't last long. If you have good mentors, the mountains won't be so high to climb. And when you reach the top of some of those mountains, just look out and look beside you and see who's there. And surely don't forget to look below and grab someone and bring them along. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fikes. And are there any Alpha Kappa Alpha members in the audience? Yay, I see a whole group over there. My Saras. Okay, I have to give a shout out <laughs> to my Saras. Okay, um, our next presenter uh, is Deirdre Hodge. And before I get to that, I want to say that uh, Councilwoman uh, Cora McFadden had another meeting and she did have to leave. She wanted me to apologize to the audience and to the panelists, but she did want to stay, but she has a conflict. Um, moving right along, uh, Deirdre Hodge is the executive director of the Full Frame Documentary Film Festival. Deirdre has worked in communications for 20 years and she began as an actor. Deirdre has filmed numerous celebrities for various cause-related issues. Uh, some of them are, uh, Kiefer Sutherland, Charlie Sheen, okay, I have to hold myself from saying winning, but I won't do that, <laughs> and, and George Lopez, just to name a few. Deirdre serves on the executive committee of the Film Festival League, a new association of film festivals to be announced at this year's Keynes Film Festival, and she recently joined the board of the Durham Chamber of Commerce. Deirdre came to the Triangle area six years ago. She is an avid theater goer and horseback rider, rider. And her husband, Joseph Hodge, is producing artistic director of Playmakers Repertory Company. They have one daughter and her name is Samantha. Please give a warm welcome to Miss Deirdre Hodge. Thank you. Thank you so much for asking me to be here this evening. I'm so incredibly humbled to be in this company and not quite sure what I'm doing here. Um, it would be extremely disingenuous for me to sit here and tell you that I grew up with significant obstacles. I am a white Jewish girl from Fairfield County, Connecticut. Uh, however, uh, when I was three years old, I suffered a very, very traumatic injury in a car accident with my mother and I was, uh, really in the hospital until I was five. And that set me back a bit. Um, but really, 45 years later, all I have to show for that is a cockeyed smile. 
However, what it did do was many, many years, I had a scar on my forehead, and I grew up really thinking that appearance mattered much more than it really does. And that held a lot of power over me. I also grew up with Jewish parents. My mother was from a very, very poor part of Arkansas. My father's a Long Island Jew. She converted to Judaism in the 50s. She never really felt a part of that community. And again, I could tell you it's, it's not a big obstacle growing up in Connecticut in the 70s, but Jews weren't allowed in the country club. And then, of course, I always remind myself there was a country club. So, you know, it's not that big a deal. But it, it made me feel like an outsider. It made me feel like an other. And I always had a, a feeling about that growing up. It's probably not a surprise that I went on to marry a Palestinian man. So it's, uh, it's always been a tradition in our family to give service. My parents, every Christmas, because the hospital where I was cared for was a Catholic hospital, every Christmas did service at that hospital. It's just a, a place I grew up in. My parents met in the military, so just to give you a sense of who my mother is, she was a second lieutenant, my father was a captain, they met in the officers club during the Korean conflict, and there's a great story about when she left the service, there was a uh, party, a coffee party at a, uh, someone's home, and the general's wife had come, and the colonel's wife got up and said, the woman whose husband had the highest rank would pour the coffee, to which my mother replied, I'm the only one here with any rank, I'll pour the damn coffee. <laughs> that tells you a little bit about who my mom is. <laughs> so growing up with those privileges, uh, my parents really worked hard for us to be in that part of Connecticut. At that time, that was one of the best public school uh, systems in the United States. and I grew up expecting that a public school education should be excellent. It's part of why I've developed the educational programs we have at Full Frame. I don't understand when it's not. And I think that is something that we owe our children. And one of the opportunities that that afforded me was really the touchstone of the rest of my life. When I was 16, I was in a very competitive chamber choir. And that choir got to travel the world. I've told the story before on Frank Stacio's show, so I beg your pardon if you've heard it. And my good friend Ruth, who was Catholic, said, we're going to meet Mother Teresa. Now, this is before Mother Teresa went across Lebanon. This is before, and I'm, again, the little Jewish girl. I'm like, I have no idea who this is. We go to India, which is in and of itself a, a hugely impactful experience. It would take an hour to explain. We were in Bombay, now called Mumbai. We lived with families. And then we moved to Calcutta. And we went to Mother Teresa's Shanti. And we were rehearsing, getting ready, because she was coming. And she walked in the room. It was outside, actually. It was a courtyard. And um, she's a very small woman, physically. And all of us began to cry. I didn't know who she was. But I swear to you, the ions in the room changed. They shifted. And we all burst into tears. And she came to us, and she held us all by the head, the way the rabbi would bless you and said, now, now, listen to mother nicely, because now you can cry, but after this, you're going to give service. And Christ is inside of every person you see, and he wants to be loved, he needs to be loved, and that's your job. And that stayed with me for the rest of my life. And we did leave after that. We worked in the home of the destitute and the dying, and I held a woman who passed. We worked in the orphanages. And I knew from that point on my life had shifted. I think the, the central point that I want to bring up about that is that for me, the two things that have been important for success is being of service to mankind, as my colleague up here said, rather than to my ego, and taking leaps of faith with gratitude. So I want to talk a little about those two things. I think in terms of knowing that I would move on and I would need to give service, unfortunately, I'd worked so hard on that exterior part that what I was very, very good at was being an actor. And I was very disciplined. So I went to one of the best conservatories. Many of the people that I went to school with are now people you would know very, very well. And I was a good actor. But many of those mentors that I came across kept saying to me, I, I think you're better than this, which I could not comprehend. I thought, well, I'll just become a great actress and start a foundation, and I'll give back to the world. 
and that was my very limited understanding of what I could do. And so I would work on these TV shows, and I wouldn't understand how the roles I was getting didn't seem to match my inside. So my outside, they'd put me in a bikini, and on my inside, I thought, but, but this isn't quite what I had in mind. And I didn't quite understand how to make that leap. So again, I think that really had to do with serving my ego, because really, if I understood what I was doing, I would have dropped out a lot sooner. I am most successful when I find work that puts me in service to the ideals that I believe in. So how did I make that transition? Well, it's a long story, but I worked for a lot of people and said, teach me everything you know. I took less money. I sold ink ribbons over the phone. I did anything I could do to learn and to make money and pay my rent. And Suddenly, this job ad appeared for a producer at the American Lung Association. And I thought, well, I can't become a producer for the American Lung Association. What, who can work from there? But I went. I was terrified to interview. I was three months pregnant. My husband, who I have borrowed courage from on many, many times, urged me to go. And I went, and I got the job. And I'd never done a thing in producing. But I knew a lot. And by taking that leap of faith, I ended up making a film that was the first public health film in the history of the state of California that had ever been broadcast, that went around to all the studios, and that you can draw a direct line from the Motion Picture Association's decision on including tobacco depictions in film back to that film about Hollywood and tobacco that I was asked to make. And it was terrifying, and I was literally on the phone on bed rest with my, you know, going into labor with my daughter, barking out what needed to happen on that film, and I nursed through post-production. And it was uh, an enormously growthful experience. I love that uh, Maya Angelou's poem is included here. I've heard her speak a few times, and one of her sayings that has always stuck with me, which is actually from a Roman poet, is, nothing human is alien to me which is why I kept coming back to documentary and why I love being here hearing stories because, of course, documentarians are storytellers. So I would urge you, when you can protect the storyteller, you protect our human history. I had that same experience making a few of these leaps of faith of borrowing other people's courage. The first one was leaving New York. I was leaving an alcoholic boyfriend. I wanted to go to Los Angeles. I didn't know any other people in LA. And my sister, who's 10 years my senior, said to me, you know, Deirdre, there are very few decisions in life that are irreversible. And that gave me an enormous amount of courage to just get on the plane and go. And I started working in Los Angeles almost as soon as I got there. The other leap of faith was coming to full frame, coming to North Carolina with my husband. I went to the job at Full Frame so late, they had, all, they had closed the search. And it was, again, my husband who said, I believe you can do this. So part of what I'm saying here, it's not just about listening inside and taking those leaps of faith. It's surrounding yourself with people of quality. Because the people you surround yourself with are a reflection of how you care for yourself. And I believe that's vitally important. Lastly, I just want to say, remember that the things that ground you are not your job, but they're the things that are at home. We do not pray before we eat in my family, but we do require everybody at the table, no matter their mood, to say three things that they're grateful for. And I know that my daughter, who turns 12 tomorrow, will remember when she's older that we did that, because there are days when we're grumpy. And there are days when we're blue. And it feels really, really good to say, I have a roof over my head. I have food in front of me. And remember where I came from in India and that touchstone. Thank you. Thank you so much for that moving story. Very moving. Our next presenter is one of our own city employees, and that is Wanda S. Page. 
Wanda Page was appointed Deputy City Manager of Durham in February of 2006. After serving the City of Durham for 18 years in the Finance and Audit Services Departments, Wanda received her undergraduate degree in Business Administration from UNC Chapel Hill in 1982 and an M MBA in 1995 from North Carolina Central University. Wanda is a certified public accountant and is, a, is an active member of the International City and County Managers Association and the North Carolina City and County Managers Association. In March of 2012, Wanda received the credentialed manager designation from the International City and County Managers Association. Please join me in welcoming Mrs. Wanda Page. Good evening. It is indeed my pleasure to be here this evening to celebrate Women's History Month. For the 10th year, City of Durham Human Relations has sponsored this forum, and I am certainly honored to have been selected to join the five other women leaders who have shared or will share their experiences tonight. The experiences that have helped shape their personal lives as well as their careers. I've already been inspired ladies. And I know that I will continue to be inspired by the successes of the, the women that are present here as well as in this room this evening. Uh, I would like to say thank you to um, Director Stansel, who is absent this evening, but Ms. Donaldson for continuing to provide this opportunity, this space that has been set aside for us to exchange ideas and share our talents, our experiences, and vision for women in our community. I would like to acknowledge my uh, family, my husband who's in the audience, uh, other colleagues, uh, friends, uh, my church family, and certainly members of the sorority, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, who are here supporting me this evening, uh, and I've been a member of that sorority for over 30 years. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for coming out this evening um, to join this celebration. As I started to pr prepare my remarks, uh, as usual, I did a little research on Women's, Women's History Month. I was reminded that it has been 32 years since former President Jimmy Carter issued the first presidential proclamation calling on Americans to remember the contributions of women in American history. I was also reminded that the idea of remembering uh, the contributions of women has been expanded to a month-long celebration during the month of March each year and is celebrated in many ways, much like the celebration we're having here this evening. And finally, my search uh, led me to the 2012 theme. I was very happy to hear Ms. Donaldson uh, repeat the same theme. I, I was sure that I had gotten it right, but now I know I did. Uh, women's education, women's empowerment. There was, uh, beneath that theme though, there was an expansion of the theme and it read, although women now outnumber men in American uh, colleges nationwide, the <coughs> reversal of the gender gap is a very recent phenomenon. The fight to learn was a valent struggle um, waged by many tenacious women across the years and across cultures in our country. So this theme really started me thinking about the tenacious women in my own life that have encouraged my dreams. I was always surrounded by women full of faith with dreams and high hopes for me, including my mother, uh, two grandmothers, and three great-grandmothers who were all alive at the time of my birth. My great-grandmothers had been born in the late 1800s and lived out their lives hoping and praying for a better life for their children and grandchildren. They were actually born in the days of Jim Crow and lived in the days of disenfranchisement and legal segregation. The last one of my great-grandmothers, Rosa Lucas, passed away when I was 18 years old and a freshman at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She didn't get to see me graduate. She never came to Chapel Hill while I studied there, as a matter of fact, I don't remember her traveling very far from Wilson, North Carolina, the place of her birth, but she was very proud that I graduated from high school in the top of my class, packed up one day, left home to go to college to get an education. She didn't know what I would have to do or steps I would have to take to realize my childhood dream of a college education, but she convinced me that whatever it was, I could do it as well or better than anyone else trying. While she couldn't help me with algebra or tutor me for my calculus test, she always told me whenever we talked to work hard, to do my best, to love and to trust God. 
As I would prepare to leave her presence, she would say, I'll be praying for you, and I really knew that she would. I did work hard. I excelled in my courses. I received bachelor's and master's degrees in business, and I have had a very rewarding professional career over the past 29 years. If I provide inspiration to you this evening to succeed, it will not be from the reading of my resume. The inspiration will not be from me at all, but from great women that never made a claim to fame, but imparted eternal principles that taught me to succeed by simply being myself every day and striving always to do the right thing for the right reason. Though my childhood days are long gone, I cherish the memories of growing up under the nurture of these women. I was born on Woodard Avenue in Wilson, North Carolina in 1959. While the house I was born in was a tiny one bedroom duplex apartment on an unpaved street on the east side of the railroad tracks, my home was filled with the love of my parents who supported me and I pursued, as I pursued the most rigorous ac academic courses in school, involved myself in community service and church activities and enjoyed sports both as a participant and a spectator. I spent much of my leisure time at the Reed Street Community Center. It's a neighborhood recreation center. I went to summer camp there, I joined clubs there, I played sports there, I took swimming lessons there. Now the swimming lessons came in very handy uh, when I had to pass a swimming test as a requirement for graduation from UNC Chapel Hill in 1982. Uh, as a young girl, I filled my life with, with every positive experience I could find. I carried these valuable experiences to college. I majored in business administration and I began my career as an accountant in a CPA firm. For the past 24 years, I have worked for the city of Durham in several positions. I've worked as an accountant, the accounting manager, uh, the deputy finance director, I've been the audit services director. With every new position came a new challenge, a new career challenge, and much, much more responsibility. And today I am very proud to serve as a deputy city manager for the city of Durham. I believe behind every successful woman is a legacy of great women that had the power to affect generations to come. This evening, I will share with you priceless gifts from four women that have shaped my life. My great grandmother, her name was Rosa Lucas. She walks beside me every day in spirit. She gives me strength for the things that I must do. When I'm weary of work and there are countless things to be done, I think about her work ethic. She was just an ideal mother and a virtuous woman. She rose before dawn and she spent her days working in the tobacco, corn, and cotton fields of a farm owned by others. She worked at manual labor well into her 70s and rendered domestic service to the affluent into her 80s. I often think of her physical strength and stamina when I need to spend long hours or put in extra effort to ensure that my own work is of the highest quality. Despite poverty, sickness, and disappointment, she had vision. She desired for her children to get a good education and a good job to support themselves. The gift that was given to me by my great-grandmother and I pass on to you this evening is have vision and a strong work ethic. Hattie Arrington was my grandmother. Hattie walks beside me in spirit and she reminds me to love mankind, have faith, and serve others. She didn't know it, but she taught me the key components of effective leadership. In my world of public service, things don't always go as planned. On my personal journey through the daily maze of challenges where simple things sometimes seem unattainable, people appear unreasonable, and stress starts to build, a calm comes over me, and I think about my grandma Hattie. Hattie had an undying love for people. She was most happy when she was serving people, putting others ahead of herself, and caring nothing about what she received in return. No matter what a person was guilty of, her forgiveness had no end. She kept on loving, she kept on serving when, e when others couldn't comprehend. She saw the best in others and believed in them anyway. The gift that was given to me from Hattie, and I pass it on to you this evening, 
is have faith, love everyone, and serve until you can serve no more. Rosa is my mother, and she continues to influence me to this day. She walks beside me, ensuring that I continually strive for excellence. She never got the opportunity to fulfill some of her dreams of higher education. She, admi she admired success from afar as she rendered domestic service to affluent families. She knew of and wanted a better life for her children. She encouraged us to dream big. She would spend countless hours with us cutting pictures from a Sears catalog or a Better Homes and Garden magazine of our dream home or pictures to represent some other big idea. She knew we had to be exposed to learn and maneuver in a different world than where we came from in order to be successful in mainstream America as the world began to slowly change for African Americans in the 1960s. She learned the social graces and taught them to us. There was never a lack of manners or etiquette or a lack of respect in our household without a sharp rebuke from Rosa. She never let our socioeconomic status determine the degree to which we would, we would feel and exhibit personal pride and self-respect. These, these sayings are replayed over and over in my head to this day. You may not be able to control anything else, but you can control yourself. When you leave my house, be presentable. Arrive early for your appointment and be prepared, she would say. I find myself repeating some of these statements to my own children. She set a high standard and expected nothing less. The gift that was given to me by Rosa, and I pass it on to you, is never forget where you, where you come from, but know where you're going and be ready when you get there. Kimberly is my sister, my only sibling, and my best friend. Over the 24 years I have served the citizens of Durham, I have found many reasons to be proud of my city, many, many advances and accomplishments we made, but like many places, we do still have challenges, and one of these challenges is related to the youth in our community. The Mayor Pro Tem spoke about that when she uh, greeted us earlier. Many of our youth are disconnected from services that they need to be successful. When I hear about a poor decision made by a young person or some senseless act of violence, um, I, sometimes I feel like I, I, I'm losing hope that I can actually um, make a difference in the lives of, of young people. And I call Kim at her school, where she serves an, as an administrator, a leader, an educator, and an advocate for children. And she reminds me that education is the key. And each one of us is an educator every day. My hope is restored, and I double my efforts because it becomes clear that we're building building our future one young person at a time. Hope is her greatest possession, and that is a gift that I give to you. So I am grateful for the past, for my past. I am certainly humbled uh, by the present, by the, by the honor this evening, and I'm confident of the, of the limitless future for everyone here uh, this evening, uh, particularly the women in the room. But I don't wanna, wanna forget the young men because there are some young men as well as some older men who are here uh, supporting the women. Um, Individually, our strength would be insufficient, but through the bonds of womanhood, we are one, and nothing is impossible for us. So daughters, sisters, mothers, aunties, grandmothers, great-grandmothers, foster mothers, godmothers, mentors, and guardians, accept these gifts, my gifts, and feel free to pass them on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wanda. And um, shortly after we started, another one of our uh, deputy city managers did come in, and will you raise your hand? Keith Chadwell? Right over there, okay. Our department reports to him, so I wanna make sure we did that. <laughs> <laughs> and there, are there other directors that I missed? And if, if there are, as we go along, please let me know. But there was, there's also, when we talk about young people, there's, there's a group of young um, Girl Scouts that are here. And I did not get their number, but I will get that information and to let you know who they are. They did send in uh, saying that they would be here, and I do see that some of them are here. I'm proud to have you. Um, the next presenter is Cynthia Penn. Cynthia Penn is an established choreographer and dance teacher with more than 30 years of experience in modern dance, classical ballet, jazz, and musical theater. 
She graduated from the North Carolina School of the Arts with a degree in modern dance. The school has since been renamed and is now called the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. Cynthia's career really took off and her dance talent evolved when she became a dancer with the Alvin Ailey Company, whose choreography has been featured at the Kennedy Center and on national television. Uh, but I'll let her tell you about that. Uh, Cynthia believes that she can be the greatest benefit to the Durham community by finding new ways to help create dialogue between students and their families and friends. Her professional love is with the University of North Carolina School of the Arts, and she has served as a member of the drama faculty since 1995. Join me in welcoming Ms. Cynthia Penn. Thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm so happy that I can share my story. Um, I'll be a little bit brief. Um, I'm a, a, a child, a girl uh, from Mount Airy, North Carolina. Um, and if you know where that is, that's uh, below the Blue Ridge Parkway and little foothills, uh, Andy of Mayberry, very small town. Um, I was a little girl that had big dreams. My dad owned uh, the community. Now you have to understand, I'm uh, in my 50s, so <laughs> a little bit beyond that, but my dad had a community store um, that um, was really a special place. It was where people got their credit if they could not put food on the, food on the table. It was where uh, people went to dance uh, on the weekends. Um, it was where I discovered a jukebox, and that jukebox had a lot of Motown music on it. And as a child, what I did uh, to entertain myself was to dance, you know, to the Supremes and, you know, Four Tops, all of that. That was my goal, to become a great dancer, and I knew that at an early age. And my dad loved to dance also, and he taught me how to swing dance, and he was just a great, warm, and caring father. My dad always had two to three jobs. Um, we saw him uh, mostly on the weekends, and, and he and my mom were very young um, and very um, dynamic. My, mom, my mom's uh, background was a little how can I say? Uh, she didn't really know her father. So um, you can kind of see I have green eyes, yeah? I don't know if you can. She didn't know that her father was white. She thought that uh, her father was a black man. And she found out later in her life that he was not. And it was something that I think for us, we always knew we were different, just a little bit different, but we couldn't quite put our finger on it. My mom was very outspoken, and I am very much like her. Um, and I've been very fortunate because what I do deals with truth. Being in the arts, it, you, you, that's what you, we discover, and we talk about truth. And uh, it's arts and humanities. You know, what does it mean to be human and, and uh, a community of people? Um, so I obviously um, was lucky because um, there wasn't a lot of dance in my town. And uh, one year, a arts program came to Mount Airy, North Carolina, and I was smitten. Um, and the teachers knew that they had discovered someone with talent. So I was um, asked to audition for a school North Carolina School of the Arts at the time, which was a private university, a private school at that time, uh, started by Terry Sanford. I was asked to come in the late 60s and um, study dance, and I had no idea how my life would change. <clears throat> I will say that leaving home at a young age was very difficult. And then when I was 15 and a half, my mom passed away. So it was even more difficult. I tell you these things because I want you to know the passion that I have for children. Um, when I uh, studied at the School of the Arts, because of the training and very professional, some of the best um, 
training. Actually, it's in the five, still in the five top schools in the United States. So if you have children that don't know of it and are interested in pursuing the arts, um, it's up there with Juilliard. So really, you should uh, consider looking at that school as an option for your children. When I um, graduated from that school and thinking, you know, oh, okay, well now I have to, you know, sort of make a career out of this because back then that's what you did. When you were 16, 17 years old, you made a career. Um, you joined a dance company in New York. Um, I was fortunate uh, to have someone come to my school named Agnes DeMille. And she was the niece of Cecil B. DeMille. Um, I don't know if you guys know a little bit about Cecil B. DeMille, but he's one of our famous uh, um, directors, movie directors. And she, of course, um, was uh, famous in her own rights. Um, she was mostly known for a Broadway uh, production of Oklahoma. Um, so Agnes um, was starting a company called Agnes DeMille American Heritage Dance Theater. And I was asked to join, and at age 16 and a half, I had my first performance in New York on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera House. And when I tell you I was scared, I was terrified. I'd never seen anything so big in my life. I didn't know they made theaters that large. Um, <laughs> it was obviously my destiny to continue to work with her. Um, and we did a tour of the United States. We started in New York, went to Florida, across to Texas, California, uh, Pennsylvania, and ended back in New York. And it was terribly exciting. Um, for the first time, I, as a, an older youth, I will still say youth or woman, I met my godmother. I met her in Philadelphia. Um, my godmother, um, was C, uh, C, Cynthia Dolores Tucker. And Cynthia Dolores Tucker, if you don't know, was uh, w the first African-American Secretary of State. She, she has had lyrics about her in Tupac's song because she fought against some of the lyrics that were degrading for women. Um, she <clears throat> was... Uh, best, well, good friends with Hillary Clinton. Um, she was a very dynamic, amazing woman that is really, um, really was uh, uh, one of those women that you think of when you think of the women that were marching with Martin Luther King. So I met her and I was so surprised at how, how our lives were going to parallel she had a passion for youth, and I, at that time, had a passion for youth. I remember telling my teacher when I graduated from school, because he was a kind of mean guy. He would poke on us and tell us to pull up and you know, make us do things that I thought were impossible. And he looked at me one day, and his name was Mr. Noble, and he said, what are you going to do when you grow up? And I said, I'm going to start a school, and it will be much better than this school. <laughs> I did start a school. <laughs> I'm not sure it's any better than the school I was at. But I knew that that was what I wanted to do. Um, so obviously, having been named and having a grand uh, godmother like her had a great impact on me. Um, I will say that <clears throat> when I worked with Alvin Ailey, that also had an amazing impact on me. Um, I worked directly with Alvin. He was alive. He plucked me when I was 17 years old, and I joined the company. Um, I started traveling all around the world. I had no idea why my life was going to become so diverse and so exciting at a young age. But now I know. I work with youth. I tell them, don't don't think that you can't do this. 
you can, I've done it, you, you have dreams, you know, it, it can happen. Um, so after about, I'll say in my late 20s, I started wanting to have a child, children. Um, I'd given so much to my career, I thought this is what I'm missing. And it was what I was missing. And a lot of people in my profession told me, you cannot have children if you, you will, things will change. You can't do that. You can't have a child. What are you gonna do with this child? Take this child on the road with you? Put this child in the theater? Yes, that's what I did. I have pictures of my son at the Kennedy Center in the orchestra pit. When, I was, when he was 10 months old, okay? <laughs> so you as, we as women know that children and bearing children is one of our gifts from God. And that's one of the things that we aspire to do. And I was very, very pleased that I could do that. <clears throat> Anyone that works for me knows that I am one of the most, um, <laughs> you can come and teach at my school with a baby on your hip. That's who I am. Um, I also believe that now we are at a place if I could say this uh, clearly, where I see, to, see a lot of young girls with babies on their hips. And they're young children. And, um, and I think as a society, sometimes we push them away. We say, well, why did you do that? Why did you have a child? Why did you, why did you decide to make your life difficult? Rather than saying to a young girl, I am here, I am your sister, I am your mother, I am your aunt, I will help you through this. I will do what it takes to help you. I think we have a double standard sometimes. Sometimes it's really easy for us to look at situations and um, to make assumptions. I'm not a big advocate of a young girl having a child at a young age, but once that child or that young woman makes that decision, I will do everything in my power to help them. And I think if there's one thing I want to say to us as women, I think we need to embrace young girls that are in this position in our communities. And I know you know a lot of them. Um, <clears throat> Not only did I have one son, I feel that I have 100 children. In my school, I'm the dance mom. I am the mother of mothers. <laughs> they talk to me, they come to me, they feel supported by me. And they also feel supported by my staff, by my board. I have a lot of board members that are, are females. Uh, two of them are here in the audience now. Um, Winona Satcher and Mary Womble Brennan, they both are amazing mentors to, to children in my school. You know, and if I have to say this, you know, a lot of times in the arts, we don't know where the money is gonna come from. But I have had so many volunteers come and give what money does not provide. Um, yes, I wanna keep the doors open, but the way that we talk about mentorship and the way that we talk about volunteerism has to be almost one-on-one -on -one. because when you, one person affected me and now I get to affect all of these other children that are in, at the Walltown Children's Theater. Um, I want to say that one of the things that I learned and one of the things I love about Durham is the diversity. There is, I don't know, um, I've traveled a lot. Um, I see so much potential in Durham. I see so much diversity in Durham. I mean, just look around you, look in the audience. Um, you don't see that everywhere. I travel a lot to Florida. Um, I have a good friend there and 
you know, I, I sometimes I look at the nice place where my friend lives and there's not a lot of diversity. Um, we have the possibility in this city to really um, not only lead an example, but create a city that can be um, a model for our country. I feel very passionate about this and I want so much uh, for the children that are a part of Walltown Children's Theater to be a part of that. Um, so much so that my show <laughs> this spring is called Civil Disobedience. I want to teach them how to protest in a way that is appropriate, how to voice, how to uh, bring their voices forward in a way that will make an impact. Um, when I was three, four years old, I was marching. I remember white only signs. I was marching, I didn't know what I was doing. My dad put us in the a Ku Klux Klan parade. He put us in the car, I tell you not. This is, my dad was so funny to me. He put us in the car and he said, wave to the people. We thought we were in the parade. <laughs> he put us at the end of the Ku Klux Klan parade. And <laughs> this little girl was, you know, waving. And I just think that, you know, sometimes, my dad, he, he was funny to me. You know, I think sometimes we limit ourselves and we limit what our children can do. And I am very concerned uh, uh, about that. I, I think that sometimes we dumb it down too much. So um, you can tell I'm passionate about that. That is my life right now um, in my career. It's to work with children, to work with university uh, students that will make an impact. And I think that is the role of the arts. So thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, I did get the name of the uh, Girl Scout troop, and it's troop number 572 from Southside Church of Christ, and they were brought in by Velma Bethay. So can you raise your hands, please, so the audience can see where you are? Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. We want you to be motivated and inspired. Our next presenter is uh, Yesenia L. Polanco uh, Galdames. Attorney Yesenia L. Polanco Galdames is an associate attorney practicing criminal defense and immigration law with Velasquez and Associates in Durham. She and her family immigrated to the United States in the early 80s from El Salvador. She has called North Carolina home since the early 90s. Yesenia received her undergraduate degree in Romance Languages and Latina, Latino Latina Studies from UNC Chapel Hill in 2005, and her Juris Doctorate from the University of the District of Columbia School of Law in 2008. She serves on the board of directors of Diamante Incorporated and several other boards as well as other organizations. She is also the president of the Young Lawyers Division of the 14th District Bar Association. Yesenia is a huge fan of food, dancing, laughing with family and friends, and lounging around with her husband, Ben, and her cat, Mystic. She is passionately devoted to leadership and social change, learning, and all things positive. Let's welcome attorney Yesenia Polanco Galdames. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so very much. I am so excited to be here. I don't think I wanna get off of this podium here because since I've lived in Durham and been here in this city council, possibly protesting from the back, I've always wanted to sit up here. Um, so you might have to you know, get call security to get me off because I really like it up here. <laughs> And I have just enjoyed so much everyone's presentation so far. I really, I, I, I just don't, I'm speechless sometimes. Um, uh, to, to, uh, just about all the contributions, about just the energy in, in, in listening to all the stories from so many 
women. It's inspiring. It's really what has driven me my entire life and what continues to drive me, the stories of so many powerful women. And my story, as well as so many other stories that we've heard today, is also about other women. It's about the women that have helped us, that have helped shape who we are today and continue to drive us. Um, and so I'm very thankful for my cousins who are here, Central, North Carolina Central University, a law school. Um, my other cousin is also here, also a Central graduate. My husband, Ben, my friends, my boss, Ricardo Velasquez, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to start off by, by sharing with you a short quote uh, from Eleanor Roosevelt, and uh, I, I really like it. It, it's, uh, it says, a woman is like a bag of tea, or like a tea bag. You can't tell how strong she is until you put her in hot water. <laughs> I really like that because <laughs> we've been hearing today about everyone's hot water, right? We've been hearing about what it means to be in hot water, what the many situations are that represent the hot water in our lives. I think that in my life, I know that in my life, I have had the opportunity to change that hot water and to really consider the hot water in my life as a challenge and, I, and to consider it more as an adversity and really almost laugh at adversity, almost tell adversity, you know what, adversity, not this time. You know, you're not going to keep this one down. And so my story goes back. Um, tools all the way back to El Salvador. I was born in El Salvador. I want to share with you where I was born so you kind of have an, an idea and a picture in your mind about where I come from. I was born in a small village in El Salvador in the countryside. I was born in a house that did not yet have electricity or running water. I was born outside of that house because in the meantime my sisters were sleeping inside of the house. Um, it was my mother and myself at that time, and, uh, and, and my grandmother. My grandmother was my mother's midwife. My grandmother was our only doctor. She was the only person in the community that knew how to help deliver babies. She had helped all of my sister, all of, all of my, my mom's sisters deliver their children, and it was now my turn. My grandmother said while she was alive that I was born under a full moon in December out in the countryside in El Salvador, and there was no one else there but my mom, my grandmother, and God, right? So it's, it's really, if you, can, if you can take that picture of a little tiny town, a little tiny house, and a little child being born that would be named Yesenia Leonor Polanco Galdames. I was named after my grandmother. Her name is Leonor. She passed in 05, and she has played an enormous part in my life, in the lives of all of the women and men in my family. Before she passed, she ruled the family. She decided what would be done, what wouldn't be done, what would be said, what we would eat or not eat. She decided everything. To this day, people that, do, that did not meet her while she was alive know her. They know who she is, they know her name, they, they remember, you know, just through, through our stories, they know her. It's really, really amazing to have had a grandmother like Mama Noy, who then taught every woman in our family and has helped us to know the, our core values, and now it's our turn to pass them on to all of the younger women in our families and in our communities. It's really, really really, 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 really exciting. So I was born in El Salvador. Um, in the early 80s, my family immigrated to the United States, first to Los Angeles, California. We were political asylees. My father was involved in the uh, Civil War in El Salvador. We, we received political asylum um, while we lived in Los Angeles. We lived in South Central LA, just a few neighborhoods um, close to Watts, if anybody remembers the Watts riots. Our community was a primarily Mexican and black community. Um, these are my neighbors. Uh, being Salvadorian anywhere is, is, is a minority, right? Except maybe Washington, D.C. But um, being a Salvadorian in this community also meant something different. So from the very beginning of my, you know, just, just uh, my experience um, in my life, I have experienced, you know, feeling 
different and being different, right? So uh, living in Los Angeles as, as a Salvadorian family, um, with just surrounded by, by uh, people that were Latino as well, but were a Mexican community. From then, I began to understand that I was different and that I would be different um, in this world. Uh, so we lived in Los Angeles, and in 1992, we moved to Durham, North Carolina. At that point, I believe we were one of the only families in Durham, I, it, that, that, the only Latino families in Durham. I remember going to school with two other Latina students at Oak Grove Elementary School at the time in fifth grade. It was uh, really a culture shock to move from a community that was primarily black and Mexican to a community that was primarily white at the time. Um, so, but it was very exciting. I, I feel like I said, my hot water has been a challenge. It has been an adversity that I can laugh at. I have been able to enjoy being different um, and, and to embrace, my, embrace the fact that I am different. Um, so living here in, in Durham for the last 19 years has been very, very exciting. It has been very good. It has been very nurturing in a way, although in a sense not knowing right at the time throughout my life that my community was considered low income. I lived in a low income community. I went to a low performing school. It wasn't until I went to UNC Chapel Hill that I realized what that meant. It's not exactly a good thing, right? So I went to, I went to a Neal Middle School um, and, uh, and at Neal I got involved in dance. Um, that's where I met some of my first, my very first female mentors outside of my family. Um, outside, of, it, be, before me, meeting uh, Karen Zemek, my dance teacher in uh, middle school, everything was ruled, like I said, by my grandmother and her influence on my aunts and my, and my family. Um, and af after Neil, I was at Southern Durham High School. I'm very proud to have gone to Durham Public Schools. Um, while at Southern, uh, I, I felt like I know that it was my opportunity to really identify what I would do with my life. Um, I, I, I really felt like it was time for me to take control. I began to drive. I began to, take, to, to make choices. Um, I was able to uh, become anything that I wanted. Uh, I, I was student body president, I was homecoming queen, I played volleyball, I worked at Northgate Mall. I am just so Durham, you know, it's just not even funny. Right? <laughs> I am so Durham, it's crazy. So um, I really loved being at Southern. Uh, again, not understanding, not knowing that at the time, I was not expected to succeed. Right, I was not. It, when when anyone anyone that saw me in the in society did not think, oh, there goes a lawyer. Look at her, you know. There goes a doctor. Not so much. That is not exactly the perspective that the that the community or that society had towards someone that looked like me. Um, so I was at Southern. I I just I have like just listening to, the, to, to all, all the women up here talking about other women in their lives have, that have inspired them, I now have like a list of women. Um, just one woman, Louisa Haynes in, at Southern High School, was my advisor, counselor, uh, mother away from home. Um, she really, uh, she motivated me in a way that was at that point critical and absolutely necessary. The, at this point in high school, and I mentioned this because this is what we are here to do today. We are here to understand that we have a responsibility to do this, to, sh to motivate and encourage other women at critical points of their lives. Here I am, a high school student, okay, immigrant, uh, first in my family to do just about anything, not surrounded by doctors and lawyers and people, you know, that, that, would, that, that could encourage me that, you know, it can be done. I don't think I knew what a lawyer looked like right, except for TV at that time. Louisa Haynes really helped me understand that it was possible. Um, I explained that I wanted to apply to go to college, that I wanted to go to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill because I had once been there on a field trip. 
That is the one reason why I wanted to go to UNC Chapel Hill, because I visited the Moorhead Planetarium in fifth grade. Never been to Duke, never been to State, never been to Central. I had no idea what any other school looked like, so I wanted to go to UNC Chapel Hill. Only application I put in, so application process for me was easy. I applied to one school. If that school didn't let me in, I didn't know what I was going to do, right? Got into UNC Chapel Hill, praise the Lord. My family was ecstatic. Nobody knew what this meant. Okay, so you're going to college. What does it mean? Do we drop you off? Do you need clothes? What? Nobody had a clue what it meant. I didn't know, I didn't have a clue, but I was excited. I got to walk around and tell everybody that I was going to college, just like I owned the place, right? That I, as if I had done this a million times before, I was going to college to UNC Chapel Hill. I got myself a t-shirt. It was <laughs> wonderful. The school year turned out fantastic. I was on my way. I worked hard. I studied hard. I applied to a million scholarships. I think I still have money left over from UNC Chapel Hill <laughs> from scholarships. If there was a scholarship out there remotely close to my description, I applied for it. I mean, I got money from all kinds of communities in, in, in Durham. It was wonderful. Um, at UNC, I really, really, again, I. I noticed, I could see, I could feel that I was different. Again, I was different, not just because I'm short and Latina at that point, but because I came from Durham. I came from Durham, the, yet another difference to add to my bucket of, of differences. I came from Durham, I came from Southern. Not everybody at UNC Chapel Hill comes from Durham or from Southern High School. I'm gonna tell you that right now, it, no, it is, it's, Gladly, over the past you know, several years, it, it, our community has been growing, and we have more Latino students at UNC, but when I was there, it was just not, not um, uh, uh, the most welcoming situation for me at the time. I struggled through my first year, um, but I made it through. And, and again, um, through my, my core values, my values of, of just being hardworking and, and devoting my life to service. Um, uh, all through UNC, all four years, I volunteered in as many organizations as I could. I founded an organization called uh, Mujeres, uh, an organization for, for devoted to, to serving women in education and health in the community. We went back to El Salvador. I took a ton of American volunteers to El Salvador to build a community center there to give back to the community that raised my mother and my grandmother and my great-grandmother and that saw me, you know, my the beginning of me. Um, and so I'm really, really, really proud of, of that accomplishment. And while at UNC, I knew then that that was my next baby step. Literally, my life has been one step at a time. I knew that my next step was law school. <sighs> Let me tell you, I didn't know what that meant either. There was an application for that. So I had to get good grades in undergrad too. I had no idea. I had to do it all over again, apply to law school, apply to a million scholarships. It was all, it's just every step is an incredible learning experience. And at that point, my grandmother was ill, she had cancer, um, yeah, I had, had some really deep conversations with her. Someone talked about, you know, storytelling and the importance of really capturing people's history through storytelling. I, I did my best to capture her stories and her history and what things mean to her or meant to her before she passed away. I had that important privilege in my life. Um, and then right, right before she passed away, I said, Grandma, I got accepted into law school. She was super excited. You know, I said, you know, I have the choice. I can stay here. I can, you know, I can take care of you. Or you can stay with my family, stay close by, or I can move away to Washington, D.C. My, my parents weren't as excited. My grandmother supported me. She said, this is, this is something that is forever. Staying in Durham, staying with your family, you're always going to have that to come back to. But going away to, call, to, to law school is something that's going to help you forever. Um, I, I moved away to Washington, D.C. I have to share one more thing. When I went to UNC Chapel Hill, it was so far away from my family who lived down here, Durham, about five minutes away. 
My mother would not come to Chapel Hill to visit me because it was too far away. She came to UNC Chapel Hill four times in the four years that I was there, including graduation. And the one time she came by herself, she got lost by the Keenan Stadium. It was awful, and she still will not venture out of, of Durham. So moving away to Washington, D.C. was a big deal for me personally. Not just that I was going to law school, but I was going away. I was going, moving away from my family. What was I going to do? You know, what, who was I going to live with out there? Um, what was I going to eat? It was, it was just those, those kinds of thoughts that I'm sure do not, they're, they're not the normal thoughts that every uh, uh, rising uh, law school uh, uh, student or applicant thinks about. So I went to, 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 to D.C., I figured it out, I found a place to live. Little did I know there would be a population of almost as big as, as uh, the population of El Salvador, of Salvadorians in Washington, D.C. There were a ton of Salvadorans in D.C., and that was very exciting. I felt right at home again, um, and it was just a wonderful experience. And in D.C., I also met my husband, now Benjamin Cole, um, my family is very excited that I married a gringo. So, you know, we're, it, it brings our, our family up in status a little bit, the fact that we have a white man in the family. It's, it's really, <laughs> he, he knows what I'm talking about. Um, it, so it, he's, uh, I met Ben in D.C. in law school. And um, while, while in law school, while in D.C., I continue to do service. I continue to think about what my role is in this world. Every step is a baby step. I'm talking here, I'm, I'm sitting up here telling you big steps, right? From high school to college to law school. My life has been a series of tiny, tiny baby steps, as I am sure everyone up here can understand. It is literally one day at a time. It is one day, one week, one year, thinking about the next step and, and really thinking about what that's going to mean for your future. Um, while in D.C., I, I finished law school. I passed the bar here in North Carolina, and I just knew that I needed to get back for two reasons. This community needs me. I, I feel very important when, when I say that, right? Like, this community needs me. I need to come back to Durham to, to contribute, to give back to this community, the community that raised me, but also to be, uh, to, to be here and be helpful for my little sister, Cecilia Polanco, who um, graduated from Northern High School last year. I felt like it was necessary for me to be here. Salvadorians and, and Catholics and, and women in general, we feel this like guilt, right? We've got to be there. We've got to just be you know, available for, for people to call on us and, and help them. For me, it was an even bigger responsibility, I felt like, for my little sister. I was first in my family, first in my community in many things. And it was hard. And, and part of my message today, um, I, I think, resonates from, from a message that has already been shared, is that you know, we do the things that we do not only for ourselves to succeed in our own lives, but in every step of the way to help pave the way, to pioneer, to, to, to you know, just make the world better for the people that come after us. Because if not, then why do we do what we do? We are one day going to step aside and, 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 and retire, and there are going to be tons of people, women, young women that are coming ahead of us that are watching your every move. Ladies up here, I am watching you. I want to be like you. <laughs> and so I came back to Durham to, to be close to my little sister, she, to, to help her, to see her through her high school years, and hopefully to further on to, to college. She received the Moorhead Kane Scholarship. If any of you know, that's one of the most pre prestigious and oldest scholarships, uh, full scholarships in the country to UNC Chapel Hill. And I'm extremely proud of her. And it just, when, 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 when that happened, it really just clicked to me. It all, everything that I've been working for, everything makes sense. This is why we are doing what we do. So, you know, I'm, I'm just, uh, I, I, I had a speech prepared, and it was wonderful. And then the women here, <laughs> the women here inspired me to, to go on and on. And, and, uh, and so um, I, I just want to uh, just, go back to my speech a little bit before, before I close. I have a message about perception. I have a message about um, what it means to, for a young woman um, it, to, to walk around in the world and what perception has to do with that. A lot of times we walk around in the world and we 
because we are unaware that others are watching, because we are unaware that other people play a great part in our lives, we tend to show our feelings. Uh, women, we tend to be very expressive. So we show sometimes fear. Sometimes we show oppression in our faces and the way we walk and the way we dress. Um, we show a lot of anger and, and, and a lot of competition and, and um, just sometimes negative feelings. I encourage, and I, I encourage everyone, um, especially young women, to turn that cycle around, to really walk around this world like you own it because you do, and really look inside at the power that is, in, that is within you in all of us and really show that to the world and say, look, world, I am powerful, I am strong. I am a leader. I can walk around and do as I please. I can get an education and I can become a dancer or a politician or a lawyer or a city council person or whatever I want or president of the United States of America and no one can stop me. Even though sometimes we still feel the fear and, and, and the anger and the sometimes oppression deep inside don't show it to anybody because they don't need to see it. Show your good side, your positive side. When you give your best to the world, the world will give its best back to you. So that's, I, I hope uh, that, uh, that I can come back again in 20 years and say that, that it really did work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yesenia, for, uh, for that inspiration. Um, is uh, Ashley Ascot present? Is she here? Ashley? Okay. Uh, there you are. Okay. I just wanted to, I just wanted to let, uh, let you all know that um, Ashley sent an email to us from the uh, Greater Durham uh, Black Chamber of Commerce. And, um, and when I looked at the list and saw how many of them had actually supported us, we were very, very pleased about that. Um, she is the uh, programming chair for the Greater Durham Black Chamber of Commerce, and they did reach out to us uh, to be a partner for this event, and they did uh, support us by uh, sending the word out and getting a lot of business owners there. So when you are out at your reception with your food or whatever, take the business cards and talk with them and learn about what businesses that they are in, because there are quite a few, quite a few. I was amazed at the different types of businesses that came in on the emails, but anyway. Moving right along, last but not least, uh, the next presenter and our last presenter is uh, Nancy Weichel. Uh, Nancy grew up in Asheville, North Carolina and attended UNC Chapel Hill where she majored in journalism and mass communications. After graduating, she worked in Washington, D.C. doing uh, business reporting. She had several jobs after that but eventually returned to Durham to work at the Herald Sun as a copy editor. In January of 2011, she was tapped to become editor of the Herald Sun, but I will let her tell you how she did that. <laughs> um, Nancy lives in Durham County with her husband, Matt, and her soon-to-be four-year-old daughter, Madeline. Please join me in welcoming Nancy Weichel. Thank you all so much, and I can't tell you what a treat tonight has been because what I do for a living is listen to people's stories, and wow, <laughs> this has been incredible. Um, and I'm very humbled to be here as well. So I'll tell you a little bit about me growing up and some of the influences that led me to be here. I grew up in a family of educators. Both my parents were teachers. My father taught high school. My mom taught elementary and middle school. And it was never a question about going to college. That was just part of the plan for us. My sisters and I were spaced four years apart for a reason. Um, so my family was also very engaged in the community, though. One of my, two of my earliest memories are my mother pulling me in a wagon uh, to protest for ERA and working the polls at our county library branch, handing out flyers. You know, who's gonna turn down a four-year-old, really, if you're handing out political flyers on election day? Uh, whenever I got older, my father ran for elected office. He was a school board member in Buncombe County. He taught in the city system. 
and a gentleman at the polls came up to me and said, oh, you don't know this man. You wouldn't know him from Adam if he walked up. Well, yeah, I have breakfast with him every day. <laughs> so my family got me involved in the political process early and taught me to care about what's going on in the community and that that's important. We did have the TV on during dinner time. We watched the news and would talk about what was going on on television. Um, tail end of Vietnam, I have some very early memories of that period because of us having the TV on at dinner. Uh, probably not the best practice, but... Um, so whenever I graduated from high school and went to UNC, I thought maybe I wanted to be a lawyer. So I got to, to UNC and took a few classes, had no real direction. I was driven, but no direction. And I became an accidental journalist. I needed to get involved in something on campus. I saw the Daily Tar Heel. I thought, well, how cool is that to have your name in the paper every day? And so I applied to be a staff reporter there and was hired and got bitten by the bug. Um, it, it was just a phenomenal experience. That's where I wanted to spend all my time. I wanted to be in the newspaper offices and from some other journalists. Uh, I understand that that's not an uncommon thing. One of them actually happens to be in the room and I'll get to him later, but, but I understand he spent a lot of time uh, while enrolled at Duke at the Chronicle offices. So I decided that journalism was the course for me. I graduated in an economic downturn. Uh, one of my friends went to Guam. That was the closest place she could find a newspaper job. I ended up going to Washington, D.C. and not working for a daily newspaper, much to my dismay. I was working for a business news service uh, covering the EEOC. It was a great time to be there. The Family and Medical Leave Act was going through. The Americans with Disabilities Act was going through. The Clarence Thomas Anita Hill stuff was going on. It was a pretty interesting time in D.C. And, you know, I got to, to have a Capitol Press Pass. I got to see some of the women who were my heroes as journalists, Nina Totenberg. I saw her in person one day, and it was like a rock star sighting for me. Um, and it was also good because I was exposed to some really good journalism while I was there. It's a competitive market and a lot of really good writers and lots of different types of journalism. So uh, one of the things that I learned there my company was acquired a couple of times, and much to my boss's dismay, as our new owners were coming through, uh, they said, well, what do you think about this computer system? They asked me, and I'm, I'm the lowest person on the totem pole. I said, well, it's just terrible. And my boss afterward said, why did you say that? Why did you speak up? And I said, well, because it is. Don't you think they want to know that? Um, I probably kept my job because of that, because they had asked me about a couple of other computer systems and programs that I liked, and that had a good, good result. So I think that one of the things that helped me there as a young person was learning it's okay to speak up even if you think you're right, and even if somebody who has more experience than you thinks this may not be a good idea, I'd follow your gut on that. Um, I eventually got laid off, though, from that job. That was a humbling experience. No job, I didn't want to move back in with my folks. I was 24 years old. Uh, so I picked up and moved to California. It seemed like a great time to go. I didn't think I would have another opportunity to do that. I had no family, no mortgage. My mother was not really happy with that move. She thought it was too far away. She thought it was too dangerous for me to drive across the country. So my parents paid to have my car trucked out. I flew out and I lived out there for about a year. It was a good experience culturally. It was a very different environment from uh, being on the East Coast, and the East Coast had been my very limited experience. One of the things I learned out there was, I, w I've been, I got hired at a paper there and was the only female copy editor on the copy desk, and I was also the youngest person on the copy desk, and I think I probably had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder as a result, but there was a very crusty, experienced journalist who I think saw through that insecurity and said, you know what, you need to learn this stuff. Here's what we're gonna do. And I'm very thankful to him. It's, my business is about, uh, I think across the country, women account for about 36% of newsroom staff, so it's a fairly male industry still. The needle has moved some. There are more women than when I started in this business, uh, but it's still not quite an even breakdown. So one of the things along the way that I've found, 
And California was the first one. I knew I was in over my head in that job, and I didn't know how to ask for help. Um, so I'm grateful to that gentleman for saying it's okay that you don't know everything. We don't expect you to. You're new. Whenever I moved uh, back to the East Coast and eventually came to the Herald Sun, I was very fortunate to have several good mentors along the way, men, um, again, uh, were, were the people who were my supervisors and who helped me along the way. And one of the key things they did, particularly Bob Ashley, who's here tonight, he was my editor and I benefited tremendously. And obviously with Bob here tonight, I'm still receiving that support and I'm grateful for that. But I think what I, I learned to do was say, I don't know everything, I need help. And I cannot tell you how hard those three words are for me to utter. In fact, I probably framed it more as, I need your advice. <laughs> We're working on that. I'm still working on that one. And that, that is something that I would encourage, particularly the young people in this room, to say, I need help. I want to do this. How do I get there? Um, it pays to be bold. It doesn't ever hurt to ask a question and to say, can we try this? You will have tremendous success if you do that. The worst something, the worst someone can do is say, no, we can't do that. I had um, two students call me up. One was uh, an, a young high school student and one was a senior at DSA. They wanted to, to uh, do internships with us. We'd never done high school internships, but we thought it was an intriguing notion once they had proposed this. And we benefited tremendously. We kept a relationship with the freshmen. She is headed off to college, I am pleased to say, next year. And the DSA student still keeps in touch with us. She is now at uh, Charleston, University of Charleston. So call up, if there is something you have an interest in, there is a tremendous wealth of talent and information in this community. And there are people who want to help, whether you are just starting in your career, whether you are midway through, your career, or whether you're, you're thinking about a second or third career. Call people up, ask for help. People want to help. I can never repay the debt to Bob. What I can do is have people owe me by helping them out. So I, I think, and the reward that brings me is tremendous. There is nothing better than seeing somebody come into a newsroom and continue that career down the road. It just makes you feel amazing. Um, be relevant and engaged in your community. That is a piece of advice I would pass along. It's important that you know what is happening in your community, whether uh, it's about access to higher education for people who immigrated here uh, undocumented, whether it is Amendment 1, whatever the political issue, make sure that you are well educated, well read on it, and call up your, your elected officials and let them know how you feel. If they don't hear from you, they may not know what the mood of the electorate is, and that's important that we do that. Um, gosh, what else can I say? I think that the mentoring is one of the themes that has run through this to our successes. And I would encourage those of you who are well along in your career to continue to reach out to young people to find ways to make things work for them. I know as the economic times have become more challenging, it's become more difficult to find those opportunities. Life happens and life happens, uh, when that does happen, there are still ways to plug people in. Um, whether it's having somebody come in and just do a job shadow or whether it is being able to find a way to bring somebody in for a full internship for us, that, that would be our goal. Life also happens with balancing work and uh, your home life. And I think that's something particularly for women that we sometimes find a very hard time striking that balance. We're still a primary caretaker, I think, for aging parents or sick parents. I know for me, one of the most beneficial experiences I had was quitting a job and moving back home because my mother had breast cancer. Best year of my life and best thing I could have done. 
Um, I did work part of that time. I also learned another valuable lesson from that. I couldn't stand the job I was in. And it's okay to say, this is not a good fit. And to try something different, be brave and be bold with that. So I was lucky that I had a former employer who said, work for me, come commute, show up part time. He knew my work ethic. He knew that while I was there, I would work hard and do well for him. So make sure you don't burn those bridges along the way. The work ethic has come up. Make sure that you let people know you are dedicated and serious and loyal about what you do. Um, and then with, with children, you know, it, finding places if that you can have a family-friendly environment. Um, my former editor stepped into my office more times than I can count where my infant daughter was playing on her baby gym because we couldn't quite get the daycare handoff thing uh, down pat for that particular day. And we have other folks who will bring their kids in the office after school to finish up homework if they can't, uh, if something is disrupted in their usual routine. People can work from home. We, we have all sorts of ways that we will work to accommodate families because it makes people, I think, better and happier knowing they have that support. Um, I can't thank you all enough for having me here tonight. I'm very grateful to be a part of this amazing group of women uh, and, and just so flattered that I was included. So thank you for your time. Okay, and let's have a big hand for all of the panelists, please. They were phenomenal, phenomenal women. Phenomenal women and such inspiring stories. That's just very inspiring, very inspiring. And now if you will raise your hand if you have a card with a question because the uh, young men uh, from the Thomas Minner Leadership Academy will take them up for you. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing that I, I don't see any hands right now, you have decided to do what we initially said, which is when, as you are at the reception and outside, uh, you can certainly talk with the panelists there. Am I missing someone? Oh, one hand, okay. If you, you do have a question, okay. Will you come up? If you don't have a car, you may need to come up so you can get to the mic. Um, so I had two questions actually, and one was for Cynthia Penn, but she has stepped out. Um, my other question, I think, um, Ms. Hodge, I believe you could probably speak to it. So how does the person who does not get chosen in a field of acting or artistry or that kind of thing, how do they balance being able to maintain that type of interest while still having to possibly work a corporate job or find another way to support themselves? How do they find a balance with that? Thank you for asking that. That is a great question, and, and I'd be happy to talk to you after even more. But what I can tell you is, um, wow, uh, I didn't wait tables. I was a really bad waitress. I worked in law firms, actually, and my husband also worked in law firms. He, was, he would do the, the graveyard shift for proofreading. I would work all weekend as a receptionist. But uh, the, the beauty of that, of course, was as an actor, any job was food. And I don't mean the food we ate, it was work, you know? And I've kept that. We were interviewing somebody at uh, Full Frame for a new position, and uh, it, was one of my, it was to work with one of my directors. And I said, when are you getting married? And she responded, and when she left, the director said, how did you know that? I said, because I was an actor for 20 years. I knew she was getting, you know? So there's a lot of food for that. Two things, one was the union provided uh, workshops for those of us that were leaving the profession to talk about the special challenges when you leave acting and going into the work world. Um, I grew up in a corporate family. My father was with IBM for the majority of his career, so that was sort of just who I was. But I learned some very valuable things in those courses at the Screen Actors Guild, which had to do with my own work ethic. Actors don't stop working, and so we'll work ourselves to death. And it was really learning, and I'm still not very good at it, that it's there tomorrow. 
leave the office. It will be on your desk again tomorrow. That's a very hard thing for me to do. Um, and I think a lot of people up here have spoken about this. And this is the thing that, as an actor or in the arts, you can get locked in and say, no, 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 I have to do this. It's a big, wide canvas. You know, I remember I wouldn't dye my hair because my agents didn't want me to. I wouldn't take a trip during pilot season. And then finally, when I let go of those things, what my agent was saying, et cetera, et cetera, I started to live, and I became a better performer. Um, Today, I find great satisfaction in nurturing other artists. That's my job. Um, and fighting passionately for freedom of speech and freedom of our media in the documentary world. Um, I, it, it's a big life, and we get to have many, many careers. And I'm not sure I'm done acting. I'm not entirely sure I won't go back on the stage someday. But for now, I think it's um, finding those other things that make you who you are. I remember the first time someone asked me point blank and said, who are you besides the man in your life and your job? And I had no answer, and that was kind of sad. And now I know, you know, by, by, um, by letting go of those expectations, I was, I was during the Gulf War, I got to go as a political aide to Israel during the first Gulf conflict. I got to go on trips with people that were amazing human beings, not in my field, that I learned a great deal from. So I used to write on my mirror, I'd put a thing up that said, take every invitation, and I'd also write, dress well. You know, because going out into the world, you bring all that back in as why you wanted to be a performer to begin with, which is really because of what Mother Teresa said, because I recognize Christ in someone else or a God in someone else, and I want to reflect that back. And that's ultimately, uh, I think, the work. I'm very privileged to be married to a director still and get to kind of vicariously have it, but that really is the answer. Life is so much bigger, and if you don't do that, you can't reflect life accurately as an actor anyway. Don't be afraid of it. One last time. Any more questions? I don't see any. Okay, we will now have our closing remarks uh, from one more question. I have a Thank you, Rosalie. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, if Sheila will come up, and I just want to say that uh, our director, Constance Stansel, would have loved to be here. She just did not feel well, and if you know her, you know she's a very hard-working civil servant, very hard-working. So she would, she just really wanted to be here, but uh, but did not, but did not feel well and could not make it. And um, and Sheila was able to come in. And she's the assistant director for NIS. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Uh, what a great program. Absolutely loving these stories that you have come here and shared with us tonight. And so in closing, I'd like to offer you a few takeaways, things to consider um, to be inspired by. Find a mentor. Borrow some courage. Take a leap of faith. Have a vision and a strong work ethic. Serve until you can serve no more. Love the diversity and enjoy being different. Walk around the world like you own it. Be bold and be brave. Let's thank our panelists for coming this evening. I'd also like to take a moment to, take, to thank the Greater Durham Black Chamber of Commerce for supporting this event. And I'd also like to thank the Thomas Mentor Leadership Academy. <laughs> Cadet Johnson. <laughs> Cadet Ford. <laughs> and Cadet Hanley.
And again, we'd like to thank Larry Thomas and Sergeant Lucas for having them join us this evening. Thank you. And finally, but not last, we would also like to take a moment to thank you for coming out and celebrating with us this, our 10th anniversary for the annual Women's Forum. And also, I forgot staff, Delilah just told me. The Human Relations staff also. Thank you.